الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد The author of Imam Shukani رحمه الله تعالى says باب التيمم يستباح به ما يستباح بالوضوء والغسل لمن لا يجد الماء أو خشي الضرر من استعماله وعضاءه الوجه ثم اليدان يمسحهما مرة بضربة واحدة ناويا مسميا ونواقضه نواقض الوضوء he says, Babu Tayammum, the subchapter of a Tayammum. And we all know that a Tayammum is the act of performing ritual purification or a substitute for ritual purification with dry matter. With dry matter. The original substance or matter for this ritual purification, this dry ritual purification, should be clean soil, clean dirt. There are further issues, different views of the people of knowledge with regards to using other things such as dust, stones, tree bark. What is important is that the foundation, the asal, is to understand the basic concept. That a tayammum is a means of spiritually, ritually purifying yourself. Or, at least we can say, Something that takes the place of actual purification, a temporary substitute, which will allow you to make salah and other things when you do not have or you cannot use water. That is the basic concept of a tayammum. The word tayammum linguistically means to seek something, to intend something, to go after something. As for in the sharia, the author is clearly explaining what it is in its description and a few simple basic words that are very clear and lucid. He says, Yustabahu bihi ma yustabahu bil wudu. He says, Tayammum is used as a temporary substitution and as a means of allowing you to do that which you could normally do with wudu or with water or ghusl, the actual original type of spiritual purification which is done by water. Let's say wudu to make things simple. In other words, the author, he's saying here that a tayammum itself is not a means of purification or it's not a means of rathir. It's not something that takes away your hadith, but it's only something that is mubih. Now, we don't want to go too deep, make things too confusing. However, there are a few basic terms that we must get to, as they say, to the nitty gritty. Just a few. And that is when a person makes wudu. And we've explained in several classes how to make wudu properly. We've also explained how to perform the ghusl properly. So now you're in a state of complete purification, all right? And we also explain the things that break your wudu and nullify your wudu. And this should show us the importance of putting knowledge together, stacking and combining your concepts of knowledge, as we've said in so many classes before. From one thing, learn 10,000 things. So therefore, we make a pyramid. We have our foundation, our basis, and we build, stack, combine, and wrap together until we have a thorough, thick, thorough, thick, from bits and pieces, from chunks that are put together and molded together. So therefore, we've discussed wudu, we've discussed ghusl, we've also discussed the things that break and nullify your wudu. So therefore, you made wudu, and you did something which nullifies your wudu, such as what? What the imam mentioned. You ate the flesh of camel. You passed wind. All right? A man touched his penis, for example. Okay? Uh, anything that breaks the wudu, as we previously explained. So therefore, now you want to make wudu again. You go to the sink, and for some strange reason, the faucet doesn't pour any water out. The water is shut off. What do you do? But it's time to make the salat. What do you do? You make the tayammum. So the author is saying that the tayammum that you perform does not remove that hadith, the physical, uh, the, the spiritual impurity. The wind that you passed, when you make tayammum, it's not taken away. But the tayammum is only used as a temporary substitution, which will allow you to pray, allow you, for example, to uh, touch the mushaf according to those who say that you have to have wudu when you touch it and any other act of worship that you must have tahara for clearness 
So the author is saying that the tayammum is not rafi' lil hadith wa inna hu mubih. It doesn't take away your spiritual, your, rich, your ritual impurity, but it only substitutes the wudu. Clear? The benefit behind knowing this is that there's some of the people of knowledge who say that tayammum in itself takes away the spiritual defilement and the breaking of the wudu. And the benefit of knowing these different views is when you find water. Do you have to make wudu instantly? Or can you keep your tayammum until you pass one again? Clear. Now we don't want to go no further in any other differences of opinion because we said that that's not how we're studying right now. We're beginners. We are babies. We're just eating Gerber right now. Baby food. That's it. We have no teeth. We're not biting on, on anything. We're not chewing on anything. We're just taking mushy peas and carrots and that's what we're eating right now. And those mushy peas and carrots, inshallah, when they're fed properly to us at the right time, in the right manner, with the right dosage, they, bathing us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, will nourish our baby bodies. They'll nourish them, make them strong until we can crawl and lift ourselves up, have a tooth or two, begin to eat some table food. Bathing life, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mentioned this in several classes before. Uh, so, therefore, that is the concept of a tayammum. So, the author says that you use tayammum and anything that is permissible with wudu, such as salat, all right, such as touching the musaf, according to some of the ulama. Anything that is permissible with wudu and also ghusl, such as a woman being intimate with her husband. Let's say a woman has her menses and her menses stop. She's no longer bleeding. She's stranded somewhere with her husband. They don't have water to make ghusl. Is she allowed to have intercourse with her husband or does she have to wait and make a complete ghusl? Can she make tayammum? Can she make the salah after coming out of her menses? You may say, well, how can a person do that? That's horrible. That's disgusting. So on and so forth. But Islam, as we said before, the Islamic Sharia is built for every time and every place. And the Islamic Sharia is not just based off of the one who has the highest standard of cleanliness and class. Rather, it's for the people who only have a little bit of water. Rather, it's for the people who don't have the luxury of taking two and three showers a day, have running hot water. Islam is for every time and for every place. And there's a difference between that which is preferable and that which is obligatory. They are not the same. So therefore, a tayammum, he says, is used for that which you would normally make wudu and ghusl for. Clear. Moving on. For who? When do you make the tayammum? He says, Liman la ma. He says, for those who do not find water. Those who don't have water. And included in this is something that um, a person, he found the water, but as if the water doesn't exist. Such as if the water was extremely expensive. He's on the side of the road, and there's a gas station, and the, uh, the, the cashier knows that he's stranded. He knows that he needs water, and he says, I'll sell you this bottle of water for $20. And the man only has $50 in his wallet. No doubt, that's going to harm him. That's going to hurt his traveling expenses, so he can make the yamum. And even though he has the water in front of him, it is as if the water is non-existent. Clear. The author, he says, Or he's afraid of using the water. That he'll become harmed and injured. Such as if you have an open wound on your arm. Okay, you had stitches. Alright, or you have a wound that's bleeding or it's pus or it's a scab is drying. And if you use the water and wash it, it's going to make the scab wet and soggy. It's going to cause infection. It's going to make your bandage wet. Okay, it's also permissible to make the tayammum. Even though you have the water. Or let's say it's extremely cold outside. And there's no way of heating up the water. Or no way of drying off. And if you perform wudu, you'll freeze to death. And there's some places like this. There's some places like this that is so cold that if you touch your door, your car door, the metal, your hand will stick to the door. Or you get frostbite. Or you pour water on the ground and before it hits the ground, it's frozen. Or if you pour water in the air, before it comes down, it's a ball of ice. There are places that are cold like this. So therefore, if you're afraid of using the water, not just a little brisky or a little brisk or whatever. It's a little, a little cold, but it's no. It's dharal. It's injury, harm then it's permissible to make the tayammum, according to the author. So therefore, we said in brief, that if you don't have water, or the water is extremely far, or if you're with other people and you get lost from your group, from your uh, caravan, the company, there's a wild animal in the woods, a bear, a black bear in the forest, you go out to make water, you go to the brook or the stream, and the bear will attack you, whatever the case may be. Whatever the case may be, if you don't have water, or you uh, technically don't have water, 
because it being far, you're afraid to get it, it's, it's like you don't have it, then it's permissible to make the tayammum. And the tayammum is to be used for that which you need, wudu, and ghusl for. Clear, inshallah. There are other views, there are other different subsidiary issues, hypothetical situations that we're not getting to right now. The author, he then says, وَعَضَعُهُ And the places that you are to use when you make, or the places that you are to put the dirt or the dust on when you make tayammum, he says, firstly, is the face. Then one's hands. All right? He didn't say hands first, like wudu. Rather, he said al the face. And included in the face is that which is included in the face in wudu. However, of course, when you're making wudu, when you're making the tayammum, you don't take the dust and rub it all around and thoroughly rinse it and wash it like water. That's different. And perhaps, be the nice subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will have the time to make an actual tutorial on how to properly perform the tayammum. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving on. The author then says, ثُمَّ yadan." He then says, the two hands. He didn't say, to the forearms, to the elbows, to the biceps. He didn't say, to the shoulder blade. or لا. He said, yadan, يعني الكفين. In other words, just the two hands. Alright? Like this and like that. And we'll show you in the story of Ibn Subhanahu wa Taala how the proper physical way of making the tiyamun. He then says, "Yam sahuma marratan bi darabatin wahida." He says he should wash his two hands, wipe them one time, with one strike on the ground, one patting on the ground. In other words, the face and the hands. You don't do once like this, then the face, then on the hands. No, just once on the ground, hands. I mean, face and hands. Face and hands. And we'll show you in the story of Bidina subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't say twice, three times, once for once, he says, once. He then says, Nawian, person that must have the intention, the niya of why I'm making the tayammum, the specific reason why I'm making the tayammum. Musammian, saying bismillah. The ruling of saying bismillah and making the tayammum is the exact same ruling of making it in wudu, according to the author. So what is it? Is it obligatory or recommended? goes back to what the author previously explained. And if you don't make review of the lessons, if you don't study and constantly review the information, then you're going to get lost as we go further on. And as we've said before in this class, and we'll say again from one thing, learn 10,000 things. And that is the successful student of knowledge is to build and to make a cluster of ilm. And that is how you become mustafid. That's how you benefit from ilm. By putting together what you learn. He then says, He says, And the things which nullify the tayammum are the exact same things that nullify the wudu. Passing wind, eating the flesh of camel, touching one's private area, sleeping, so on and so forth. As he explained in the previous chapters. This is here is a very, very clear, lucid explanation. Very good, very thorough for the beginner. Nothing is con uh, yeah, any controversial or nothing is complicated, inshallah, clear and simple, on the basics of the tayammum. As we said, all of these points are not agreed upon by all of the ulama. Many of them are, most of them are, but not all of them. And there are other issues, other branches, other hypothetical situations and scenarios that we're not going to get to right now. We're not going to get into them right now. So, within the next final ta'ala, we will make a tayammum tutorial, uh, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The next chapter the author mentioned, he says, Babul Hayd. He says, the chapter of Hayd, of minces. And we'll mention that in our next session. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. If there are any questions or if something isn't clear, please feel free to post your questions. That way we can try our best to serve you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.